Welcome back to Bill Fortney's Photo Vlog. I got a phone call from dear friend Jim Haverstock the other day and we were talking about the vlog and I asked him to make some suggestions of things he thinks I should do in the future with subject matter and he said why don't you uh, get on your blog BillFortney.com and ask the people that read the blog to submit questions that they would like answered or discussed. I thought it was a great idea, so I did that, and I got some questions. I'm going to start with the one I got from Jim. Uh, I won't identify everybody else, but uh, Jim Haverstock up in Bloomington said that he had a decent Epson photo printer, and it was becoming a little bit long in the tooth and was going to need to be replaced, and he wondered what I did about making prints and if I used a inkjet printer and what my thoughts were on that. Um, I certainly have some thoughts and as everything that I do on this vlog, these are strictly my opinion. But my experience with doing inkjet printing is that if you get really good at inkjet printing and it's not that hard to do, you can make wonderful prints and it's a nice thing to be able to do that. However, if you don't print a lot, and by a lot I mean at least maybe once a week, um, a couple of things happen. First of all, your printer heads will get stopped up and they won't perform the way they're supposed to. And you won't make great prints if that happens. Um, the other thing is the cost of ink and paper really starts to mount up. So unless you're selling prints or you have a good reason to spend that money for prints um, and you print frequently, uh, there's a good chance that your printer heads are going to get stopped up and you're going to cease to make the kind of prints you want to make. Um, I've owned a bunch of inkjet printers. Uh, mostly all of them have been Epson. Had one Canon. I thought it was a great printer as well. Um, the thing about those printers, I had several that took the 19 inch paper. And I finally decided I needed to make a really big print so I got an Epson that took 24 inch wide paper. Quite expensive printer and the, buying the paper and the ink, believe me, you don't even want to go there. It's like a house payment to put new ink in that printer. But it printed for a long time with that amount of ink. The thing I learned though was that if you make pictures that are 24 inches wide by whatever length, that unless you have a place to frame them and hang them, they're going to end up rolled up and you're going to take them on the road to workshops and presentations and show them to people um, and impress them with what the printer will do. But it doesn't take long before they get dog-eared and they're worth really nothing except just to do that with them and show them. Plus, it's hard to travel. If you go by air, it's hard to travel with rolled up prints to show people. It's almost impossible to get big ones in your luggage and it means requiring uh, carrying a big long tube on the airplane. And if you already have other stuff that you want to bring on the plane with you, it's just tough. So I guess my advice would be uh, to Jim and anyone else that's wondering, if you really want to get good at printing and do a lot of printing uh, and you want to be consistently doing prints, uh, you can save some money and you can make some wonderful prints. But if you're not going to do it pretty frequently, um, the madness of trying to keep your heads on the printer clean is going to become a real issue for you. And for that reason, I just found a good lab and when I need a big print, I send off a file and just get it printed. Um, when I'm home, I have a little office work to do, vlogs, blogs, and all that kind of stuff, registrations for workshops, and I really don't have a lot of time to deal with printing. Uh, but that's not to say you shouldn't. However, if you get into it, know that it's going to be number one, costly, and number two, you're going to have to print a lot to keep that printer working the way it should. We've got another question from Dick G. I thought this was a great question. It's one that we all wrestle with. What is the cure for gas, gear acquisition syndrome, or is there one? Well, uh, Dick, I've been struggling with this for a long time. I mean, I love camera gear, and I've truthfully got more than I can carry and more than I can use if I try to go out and use it all at once. So I'm not probably the best person to answer this question. Uh, John Shaw, the famous nature photographer and the, one of the guys that I learned in the beginning a lot from, used to have a saying that before you buy any new lens or piece of equipment, be able to list 10 reasons that you need that, that lens or that camera body or whatever it is, tripod, piece of equipment. 
but he used to also say that nine out of the ten reasons can be that you just want it, that's just lust, lust for equipment. <laughs> and that's probably actually the way I decide what to buy. But in all honesty, um, I think one of the things that you have to think about is if you have 12 camera bodies and 60 lenses, you're not going to take them everywhere you go. So you're going to have to pick the body or two and the five or six lenses that you want to use on any trip that you travel on. And that means all that other stuff is sitting at home in your equipment closet. And let me tell you something. Gear sitting in an equipment closet when you're in Paris, trust me, is worthless. If you don't have it with you, you might as well not own it. Now that's not to say that you can't own specialized pieces of equipment, uh, special micro equipment for those kind, that kind of work, maybe an extra long telephoto lens you use for wildlife, bird photography. Um, but if you're not going to have it with you or not going to use it, then unless you're an equipment collector or just love to look in the closet and see all your stuff, it's kind of hard to justify doing that. I think most people would be perfectly well off with a couple of camera bodies and lenses that take you anywhere from really wide to really long and in as few lenses as possible and a few specialized lenses. I've got some fast single focal length lenses that I love to use. They don't get used as much as my zooms. I covered that on the last vlog, but I still want to own them and that's fine. But if you have a piece of equipment that doesn't get used, say over a period of a year, you need to think about letting someone that could enjoy that lens or that body get a hold of it and then use those funds for taking a nice trip or uh, spending some money on a class or, or pick up a lens that you don't have that you know you would use. I just recently sold two lenses that really shocked my friends, the 16 to 55 28 and the 50 to 140 28 in the Fuji line, both of which are exceptionally good lenses and everybody holds those lenses in high regard. The problem is I use the 100 400 instead of the 50 to 140 and I use my 18 to 135 instead of the 16 to 55. So those two lenses sat on the shelf and if I did take them in the field, they were just extra weight that I rarely ever used. Nothing wrong with them, but something wrong with them if you own them and you don't use them. So Dick, I guess the thing I would say is think carefully about what you need, how much you want to carry, what you can afford. and uh, we all own too much. We all have too many pieces of gear. Uh, and I'm in the process of trying to whittle mine down. But you should do what you think you should do. I got a, a note from Linda K. says, I noticed you and Jack use the same really right stuff tripod. And the model is too heavy for me. We are using the TVR Series 33. Uh, can you suggest something lighter? Um, I have an old saying that I guess I've kind of become well known for. And that's, that there's two kinds of tripods, those that are easy to carry and good ones. Uh, unfortunately, the better a tripod is, the heavier it's going to be because it needs to be sturdy. And the whole point of a tripod is to keep the camera from moving. But uh, Really Right Stuff has a 2 series, which is a little smaller than the 3 series. I think they're still very sturdy. The only issue would be they don't go that tall. And so depending on your height, uh, you, you might get away with a 2 Series, Gizzo, Manfrotto, uh, there's a, a bunch of good brands out there. Um, but what I would try to do is get the biggest and heaviest tripod that you're comfortable carrying. Go to the store, pick one up, walk around with it. When you find the one that you think will work and you put it, your camera on it and make sure that it's steady, uh, then that's the tripod for you. I also am a big believer in ball heads. I, mean, I use uh, the really right stuff heads. I have BH55s on two or three different tripods. And I, I mean, it's a heavy head, but it is super steady. And when you lock it down, the camera stays exactly where you have it aimed. And that's the whole point of a tripod. So Linda, um, try to pick the heaviest thing you think you'd be comfortable carrying, and that'll be the best tripod for you. Uh, Jeff N. said, do you use filters and what brands do you prefer? Um, well, I used to work for Nikon. For 11 years, I was a Nikon tech rep. And truthfully, I still think Nikon makes some of the best polarizers that you can buy. And I think Singray makes great polarizers. Most all of the polarizers that I'm using today are either Nikon or Singray. Now, uh, BMW, 
uh, make very good filters and polarizers as well. The reason I'm talking about polarizers is that's the only filter that I generally use. I have some neutral density filters for long exposures, uh, and I have, but I have rarely use any kind of an ultraviolet or skylight filter. Um, I just try to protect the lens. I try not to put another piece of glass in front of what's already been designed to be a very sharp piece of, of glass in a lens. So I don't use those filters, but I use Singray, uh, some BMW when I can't get those sizes in Nikon and Singray. Most of my Nikon filters are some that I've had forever. Um, the reason those three brands is that they are among the most neutral. Uh, if you put several polarizers in the store on a light corrected light table like we used to use for looking at slides, you'll notice that they are slightly different colors and you want the one that's the most neutral gray so that it doesn't introduce color into the photograph. And I found Nikons and Singrays and BMWs to be exactly that. Now Singray makes some warmer ones that are slightly warm. If you like that look, that's fine. Uh, but you really want to try to get as neutral a polarizer as you can. On other filters, those same brands are great. You, you just want a, a filter that is what's called Plano Parallel. That means both sides of the glass are exactly parallel the way it's ground and that will keep from introducing any unsharpness into your lens. I've had filters that were so bad that an autofocus camera wouldn't autofocus. So you need to be very careful about getting good quality filters. Why buy a thousand dollar lens and put a ten dollar filter in front of it? Um, I think that's a false way of saving money. Uh, Ted B asked the question, said I have a question about batteries. I'm a Fuji user as well and do you use batteries that you can buy on Amazon that are much cheaper, are they safe? Well, I can't speak, you know, a lot of people, I'm an ex-photographer, which means Fuji has allowed me to go out and speak for them, and I do talk, as you all well know, I love the Fuji system, and I love their stuff, but I'm not, um, I'm not qualified to give you the company line on batteries. I'm sure that Fuji would say they would prefer you stick with the factory battery, the one that they make. But in all honesty, those batteries are much, much more expensive. I have a number of those batteries, but I've also bought the Wasabi brand off of Amazon. You currently can get a couple of those batteries, and they just recently came out with two batteries and a dual charger that'll charge two batteries at once for like $24.95, something like that. I just ordered another pair the other night because I wanted to try out that charger, and I'll let you all know how it works. But... Um, the Wasabi batteries, as far as I'm concerned, have worked just as good, lasted just as long, and I've had no issues with them. I've not yet, in four years of using Fuji cameras and batteries, I haven't had a battery go bad or get to where you couldn't charge it. But I have maybe 14 batteries to, that fit the X-Pro2, the X-Pro1, the X-T1, and X-T2, and that's all the WP1, I think it's a 126, but those batteries have all held up well. I've had no problems with them. Um, I want to just say that I'm really enjoying doing the vlogs and getting the chance to share things with you. I really would appreciate it if you would shoot me an email. If you have something that you'd like to suggest, uh, any helpful hints for me. I'm new at this video stuff and so I'm learning as I go. And also if you have any, any idea about something you'd like for me to talk about. Um, Thank you for joining me. Always great to get to share with you. And uh, you have a great day. Go out and shoot some wonderful images. And God bless.